Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the Audit, Finance and Risk Committee meeting. And um, I invite uh, Councillor Karako to open the meeting with a mihi whakatau and karakia. Ako tēnei uh, karakia uh, tīmataka o te reo Māori uh, e hui hui e takata. Uh, Tukua te wairua ki a rere ki a taumata hei arahi i o tātou mahi mā te tātou whai i kā Māori rawa ko Pākia tīkaka a rātou mā kia kore ai e karo ki a pupuri ki a whakamaua ki a tīna, tīna, haumi e, hui e, taiki e. A ko tēnei karakia uh, o te reo Pākia. Allow one spirit to exercise its potential to guide us in our work as well as in our pursuit, both Māori and Pākehā, so that it can be retained forevermore, never to be lost, so that it is certainty and is maintained, so that it is secure. Amen. Um, tuatahi, uh, ko tēnei uh, mihi um, o te timataka uh, o te uh, komiti uh, aitiaki o te putia o te taio uh, o Waitaha. O te kaunihira. Ano reira ka me nui ki te mihi atu ki tō tātou matanui taraki a koe te timataka me te pakaute ko tau katō. Ano reira ka mihi au ki te kai humai o ka mea pai katō. Uh, e mihi atu uh, ki a koe o te mana whenua o te pātawhi tō te kohaka kaukai o waro no marumaru o mauka tere ma ko whakaruru hau o naitu a hurihi. O reira e nga mate. Uh, mau maharatia uh, o nga mate o ko te tenei wiki o te raro. A haere atu rā, a Maria Grace Hemmer. A haere atu rā, mō Baba William Thompson. A haere atu rā, ko Sheena Kona Stone. O reira, e, e Maria Grace Hemmer, mō tō waka o Aotea. A Baba William Thompson, a mō tō rangatira a, o Aorua, a, o Bluff. A nō reira, a Sheena Kona a Stone. Uh, mō tō tuahine o Wally Stone, uh, mō tō rāpaki o Taraki Whakaputa. Nō reira, e nā mate haere atu rā, haere atu rā ki te pāta whakawairua, e takoto, takoto, takoto. Takoto i rangi Māori i rongi i tō waka, a hui atu tō waka ko tō tārai haere, haere e haere atu rā. Nō reira, uh, let the dead be the dead and the living be the living. Nō reira, koutou rā, uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou e mihi atu ki a koutou katō. Kia ora. Good form, we have a, a quorum present and I'm pleased to open the meeting. Um, there's been no change to the order of business and uh, we'll, we'll begin the meeting. Um, I understand there are no apologies. Does anyone have uh, any conflict of interest in the items on the agenda? No. Um, there are no public forums or uh, deputations or petitions today. And um, there's no extraordinary and urgent business, and there are no notice, notices of motion. So we'll move to item seven, seven point one, the unconfirmed minutes of the Audit Finance and Risk Committee, June the seventh. Are there any um, matters of accuracy that uh, anyone has picked up on those minutes? None confirm then that um, the Audit Finance and Risk Committee confirms the minutes of the Audit Finance and Risk Committee held on the 26th of April 2023. Over mover, Peter Scott, Graham Naylor. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Carried. Item 8, 8.1. It's the uh, Audit Finance and Risk Committee's resolution status report. Um, Charles, would you like to uh, speak to that. Uh, this is the report that uh, summarises the progress that's been made in relation to the uh, resolution passed previously by the committee, uh, myself, or Brian or Tonya. Thanks, Charles. I was wondering if you could just update us on the progress on um, procurement and the um, update on the targeted training. Is that uh, Brian? Brian, maybe. To update on procurement and Tanya will update on okay, risk Tanya, training. Okay, you update on the, on the second question? Um, obviously, uh, some time has passed since that item came up. Um, in the procurement space, we've been making quite a bit of um, 
progress. Um, a team leader, new team leader we acquired um, late last year has been substantially changing the profile of the situation there. So far, um, we are in a position where we have updated the procurement policy last year, obviously. Um, we have done some work on simplifying the procurement process and updating uh, our spending thresholds in that for inflation. We're working on um, actually um, creating an effective contract register currently. Um, we have refreshed the intranet site so as to make it easier for staff to understand what their um, requirements are of them. Uh, at the moment, um, the team is working with the communications team to produce a roadshow, which will be rolling out around the organisation, ensuring that people are aware of their procurement um, authority and requirements. Um, a new refreshed induction training pack has been produced in order to make sure people know from the get-go um, exactly how procurement works in the organisation. And uh, at this point, we're awaiting um, additional uh, help from the digital team on setting up a new, more automated um, contract register. So we've made substantial progress at this point, and um, we have further to go. Uh, no. I just have uh, a couple of questions around um, what you've just kind of given an overview of. Um, one of them um, is noting that when you look at the Crown procurement process, uh, there is a percentage in there um, that they must engage with Māori. So hopefully that's kind of in the same light as we're looking at here. But um, when you say Māori, and particularly when we're in the um, uh, the, uh, the council, ECAN is actually only within uh, the Takiwa or the Rohe of Naitahu. And so um, it's just a point actually that I want to make is that it's Naitahu Māori. Or maybe you might get into difficulties because there could be other Māori who are Matawaka um, that actually reside within that Rohe. And then when you look at what we say is Aroha ki te tangata, love to all. So maybe there's an RFR process, quite a first refusal of Naitahu and then move it on to the uh, the other Māori, I'm not sure, but I just want to make that point. Um, and the other one is that um, with uh, my travels around Papatupurunanga, there is actually a number of our people that are actually involved in jobs for nature. And we know that that's coming to an end. Um, but what we what has happened there is that they have actually been um, uh, upskilled uh, to do environmental uh, mahi work and so this I'm just making the point that this is actually very timely and I'm just wondering how long is it going to take because um, I know there's a bit of frustration out there already waiting on this policy so probably that's my question how long will this take? Um, well the policy we refreshed late last year so it's already in action for the present time um, the team is busy getting their ducks in a row on a wide range of issues because the procurement um, within the organisation has um, not been as well developed as it should be. And But certainly um, putting the policy um, into action will be one of those actions that we'll be taking. A uh, couple of months maybe. I mean, we're working at pace on a whole raft of things, but certainly that is one of them. I'll just make the point that um, the longer you leave it, um, the more frustration you're going to get out there, because there's already frustration out there now. So kia ora. Thank you. Any other questions for Brian? No, thanks, Brian. And uh, Tanya, I wonder if you could address that issue of the um, ongoing training support and and how that's going, that would be great. Yeah, um, so far our focus in that risk space has been on the strategic risk register and um, building relationships. So we've had some really targeted conversations with a number of the ELT around 
um, you know, progressing that risk framework into their operational areas. We've spoken to um, leadership and development to kind of, or learning and development to kind of see how we can tap into training that already exists or, you know, new training. Um, we've been approached by some portfolio leaders to help them with, you know, um, developing some of the risk registers. So we're kind of still finding our way on what the best approach is, but this is actually part of a bigger piece of work that's on the goal, which is basically developing that, you know, risk maturity improvement plan that will cover like a three to five year period that's aimed at raising the risk maturity of the organisation as a whole. Great, thank you. Any other Giles, I just wanted to support what <clears throat> Brian and Tanya uh, have articulated um, because we could have developed and rolled out training for staff and ticked the compliance box. What we're trying to do, particularly in the areas of risk management and procurement in this, uh, in relation to this, is to ensure that the changes we make are embedded and sustainable and change the culture. So Brian has already identified and articulated that in the procurement space, we're working on a contract register and a number of other changes rather than going, hey, let's roll out some training and tick a box and say everyone's been trained. Because that's actually not going to improve our procurement. Yeah, that's that's great. I think that's, yeah, as you say, it's part of the raising of the bar. Um, any other questions? No more questions. Thanks, Tanya. Let me take them. I'll, um, I'll put the motion and then there'll be an opportunity for discussion if there's any further discussion. So that so the um, motion is the audit finance and risk committee notes the status of previous resolutions provided in the status of audit finance and risk committee resolutions report June 2023. Do I have a mover? Councillor Southworth, Graham McGlynn. Any further discussion? No further discussion. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Carried. Thank you. We move to item uh, 8.2, financial performance. Um, oh, Brian, um, would you like to go to the table? And could you just please go through that for us? Thank you. Um, as usual, we have produced the um, financial performance report this time to the 30th of April. Um, the trend we are obviously seeing is continuing where we are materially underspent compared to our budget and we completed a 9 plus 3 forecast which expected um, we will complete the year uh, about $6 million less spent than we had expected to be. Um, in the April report we are skating under that um, forecast even further. Um, the initial May indication that we received yesterday is that some of that um, difference, additional difference is being caught up. So we are expecting to finish the, um, the financial year pretty much on that 9 plus 3 forecast, bearing in mind that there will be also other balance sheet um, write-offs and adjustments which will impact on that final number. Um, I suppose any questions on that report? Councillor uh, Sunken. Uh, thank you. Not not a question, but I just really want to congratulate you and the team on on the way this is now formatted. Um, we've had different iterations, but for me to to read through the the different portfolios, income, expenditure, exceptions, uh, the risk and, and analysis is very very clear on a page. So. Thank you very much, and you provide enough information to then pique the interest to ask the questions as to what might be going through. So, thank you. Hi, McGlynn. Your uh, nine plus three is looking at five million surplus bottom line, but how much of that will need to be carried forward in reserves because we haven't delivered due to timing of projects and that sort of thing, and we need to carry funding forward to actually meet our tar targets that we promised in this year's rates, if you like. An element of that in terms of uncompleted um, projects, but a lot of those tend to um, correspond to things which are 
completed under grants and that is compensated for in the um, forecast information we've provided. So it, there will be an element, but not a, a large carry forward issue. This is Scott. Uh, just um, a clarification, Brian, on essential change pool. Um, that was a mechanism we used in the current year to um, basically allocate funds to Te Hapaio. Um, we, we bring back some uh, funding where we had some programs that weren't going to be as large or as or completed in the current year and allocated that to Te Hapaio during the year. So essentially, essentially, <clears throat> essentially that is some of that money that you spoke about uh, in response to the question from Graham, is it? Unallocated to anything and specifically, so it will sit in a general reserve or? If it remains unspent, yes, it will sit in the, the general reserve. Any further questions? Graham McGlynn. Page 26, um, budget risks the flagged up ongoing consent application backlog, expected increase from discounts given to applicants. Um, our chief executive has spoken in past meetings about what's been done to try and address it. Is there any uh, update on that information and how we're performing on this statutory and regulatory duty? Um, there is, of course, a, um, as I understand it, a project has been spun up to deal with the backlog. Um, they are working through a, um, a process of forming a plan and doing discovery work on the exact nature of some of the backlog items. Um, and people are being pulled in from across the organisation in order to give it priority. Councillor so Scott. Substantial improvement. Thank you. Um, any further questions? Thank you, Brian. It is a very good report. Um, there's no further questions, then I'll I'll put the motion. And then we have an <coughs> opportunity for discussion if there's any more later on. The recommendation is that the Audit Finance and Risk Committee receives the Portfolio Financial Performance and Financial Results Report for the period ending 30th of April 2023. We have a mover. Councillor Suncall, Councillor Scott. Any further discussion? Councillor Scott? Yeah, I do. I do. I have got a, um, I guess, a view on this. And, and I forgot to say to Brian, uh, I spent, um, Got up quite early on Saturday morning, no Matata, went through this report. So I was thinking about it and forgot my wife's birthday. Um, didn't recognise it was her birthday until one of the grandchildren walked through the door and said, uh, well done, Granny, uh, congratulations on your birthday. And I thought to myself, gee, I'm in trouble here. <coughs> so that's the quality, quality of your report time. That was the excuse I used anyway, so I'm still, I don't know how I'll get over that, but there we are. Look, there's a number of things that have come to mind uh, uh, in reading this report, and I think um, that that I would just like to flag that are in my head. And I think that there's a lot of unknowns here. There's a lot of unknowns in terms of our, um, our future, and, and I'll point to the question that Graham asked, I guess, around consenting and our regulatory function here. We know there's a serious piece of work going. Uh, on there, but we know we've also got 25,000, 26,500 consent, or whatever it is, um, which is not, which is which is a big number. And we also that know that regulatory change. Every time we get some regulatory change, it changes the conditions and terms and things. And we know that we're heading ourselves into an area where um, some of these consents, as written with the best intentions in the world, may not be able to be renewed. Uh, and so we, we've got a difficult period ahead of us. Even though we might get the consents down to a manageable number, there's a difficult period ahead of us about how we go about that. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, the Awa decision, of course, that's coming out soon, and we may have to do um, uh, something about that regarding plan change. So that whole area is a concern to me about what expenditure we might need, and I don't think we're going to fall over a cliff here in that expenditure. 
in terms of discovery around consent and how read process is going to uh, end. So I, I'd just like to highlight that. The 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 public transport thing to me uh, is in a state of flux at the moment. We will uh, we we know that the national ticketing system is coming along, but we know that that is not uh, the silver bullet that we're looking for. It's going to be a massive help to us in terms of data gathering and our ability to adjust fares and, and do those sorts of things and give us more data about um, you know where, where activity occurs and what we can do about that. We've got an increased increased um, desire for those um, on-demand services, uh, and and we know that uh, just looking at um, uh, you know the rest map, uh, rapid mass rapid transport in in Christchurch uh, area, if that goes ahead, there will be areas that will be requiring a different service to service them. Um, uh, you know, and the demand from people that have already come through the submission process on access uh, to stay in their own homes around those things where they can't walk to bus stops and those sorts of things is becoming increasingly uh, concerning uh, uh, to us, and, and we keep we keep getting that stuff in front of us. That's another issue that we have. I know that that will be targeted, and we have a conversation with those communities, but that's there. Uh, the bit that we're trying to deal with at the moment, uh, floods and disasters tomorrow could happen, you know, and we could be up for another chunk of money that we have to put in there. Um, you know, already highlighted uh, our planning process that we're going through at the moment uh, with a target date of December 2024 in place. There's a lot of rocks on that road. You know, it could it, it could cost us more. We might not make that date. We, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff there. So I, from my point of view, there's a whole lot of risk in terms of money that we may need to spend in the future. And then we've got an LTP process to go through, which we've talked about uh, this morning. And again, uh, the contentious issue, I guess, that I got myself in a kerfuffle and got misquoted about, but I think it's still an issue that we need to consider seriously is biodiversity. Um, where we've got that step chain process that we entered into in 2017 or 18, whatever it was, and how do we continue with that? But also those emerging issues, we've got pines, wadding pines, the funding's gone. Um, you know, do you want, do you want uh, our high country looking like Canada? You know? You'd be driving through a forest when you go over Burke's Pass and go over Lindus into another forest on the other side, and that's that's a possibility if we don't say anything about it. The wallabies, the wallabies may help actually; they may eat the bloody thing, so that that may be a help. Maybe you should just release the wallabies to do us a good biodiversity job. But they are in are an issue, and then the issue that was brought to us by Rail Pucky, which increasingly concerns me, is Sabella, uh, the fan worm that they found over there, and you know what's their response to that? We have second tier biosecurity response. What's our response to that? And the emerging issue of the golden clams up in Waikato, which is going to, if if left, um, if left to their own devices, could clog up Carapio, Carapiro, some of the drinking water services, and go right down the Waikato River. So there's some stuff there that we don't know about, you know. And, and be sure that in three years' time there'll be another thing there. So you know. I don't know if I've covered everything, Giles, but I think that we've got a lot of risk in our future. I don't know how we do that in terms of um, covering that all, but that's what I got out of your report, Brian, and I missed my wife's birthday. Thanks, thanks, Peter. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we, we're still in, uh, despite those risks, obviously in the next quarter, um, we still have uh, fundings and and uh, the nine plus three uh, surplus is is uh, looking good, uh, but we're still looking at it in terms of land and water, um, in terms of capital costs, uh, the flood protection stuff. I think my memory is just slightly on on hold because of some some issues, but um, you know that's still a big chunk of money out there uh, at some point too. Um, all right then. Look, if there's no further questions, um, uh, sorry, no further discussion, uh, then that motion has been put. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. Thank you. Let's come to item 8.3, health, safety, and well-being, and invite uh, Lisa Vanderplay, who's on line. Uh, if if Lisa, if you could comment on this report, that would be great. Thank you. 
Thank you, Shia. Um, I'll <coughs> take the health, safety and wellbeing report as read and welcome any associated questions to the report. Thanks. Brandon. Thank you, Chair. Um, the stop work notice, and I'm looking at paragraph eight of the report, first item spraying from vehicles, uh, ended up being fairly high profile. Um, have we done a root cause analysis going right back to the beginning about how we got ourselves in this situation and what learnings that we ought to make uh, from this, the, the way that this was um, ended up being added to the utes, what happened, what was the risk profiling of it and all, all the rest so that we next time if someone has an idea, we go through the right processes to make sure we don't end up in the same place. Thank you. So in, in regards to the spraying from vehicles, um, I can't make comment on what was decided in the past. However, following the allegations, a high priority was placed on that method of work, which was spraying from a ute. The utes were, the units, sorry, were immediately removed. And the task is currently under review with a working group that is deciding those next steps. It's really important to also note that this will include if this method will actually continue in the future and any actions that um, or corrective actions will actually come through this working group as as they proceed over time. Thank you. If I could through the chair just note that we probably should spend a wee bit of time not excessive amounts but do a bit of history delving to see what happened to make sure we don't repeat uh, the history because that's I have a saying that it's not such a crime to uh, make a mistake once, but it is a it is a crime to make the same mistake twice because it demonstrates you haven't learned. Thanks, Graham. Giles, if you like, take a call. Yeah, I I take where you, where uh, Graham's coming from. I think Lisa and the team and the rest of the organisation are focused on, uh, in particular, the ten I believe it is critical risks of actually going. Uh, how do we make sure that we take an organisational perspective to those risks, identify um, the uh, components of that and put in place the standard operating procedures to ensure that things like safe operations from vehicles, safe roadside spraying, operations of helicopters are addressed systematically and systemically across the organisation going forward. Clearly in doing that we will uh, have people who have institutional knowledge who will understand why certain decisions have been made. So we will pick up some of those lessons from the past um, because you know we know that there is work to do in this space. Thank you. Uh, Ian, you have a question? Just, just, just uh, clarity, and, and is this up to date in terms of that, uh, the items that Graham just talked about? Because I thought I understood that we'd uh, sorted our, our uh, standard operating procedures for willow planting when that was going ahead now. That, that, that is correct, Ian. So the pole planting um, SOP has been signed off by the general manager in operations and willow pole planting has commenced. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, there's no more. No more questions. Uh, thanks, Lisa, for that. And I just want to um, uh, express, I think, from the committee's point of view, that this item, um, health and safety well-being, is now in the main agenda. And as as, as long as we, we we can keep that there, so that the public have some visibility about health and safety issues and where we're at, and what you're doing in terms of um, raising the bar in terms of um, standard operating procedures and uh, analysing and critiquing things that may or may not have gone wrong. So that's good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Further questions? So what I'll what I'll do now is um, put the motion that the Audit Finance and Risk Committee receives the report on health, safety and wellbeing. Take any further discussion? No further discussion. Mover, please. Councillor Suncall, Councillor McGlynn. Any further discussion? No further discussion. All those in favour, please say aye. 
against. Carried. Thank you. Move to item 8.4, the Bangkok Treasury Services update, 31st of March 2023. And I invite uh, Brian uh, and um, Miles O'Connor from Bangkok to the table. Welcome, Miles. Look forward to your report and I understand you've got a presentation for us as well. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Are you ready for me to? Um, so we've got the we've got this presentation up here, which is the uh, which was just prepared the other day. There's also the quarterly report. Um, do you want just to take the quarterly report as read, and uh, I could take questions on it? Yes, I think we'll do that. We'll take that as as um, read. Uh, Maybe if you proceed with the presentation and then we'll just take questions for both. This is just a, so the chart that we've got here is the uh, the US and the New Zealand 10 year bond rates going back five years. Um, New Zealand is in black and the US is in red. And it does show <coughs> uh, obviously the very strong up movement that we've had uh, in interest rates that started in about October 2020. Uh, in uh, November 2020. In August 2020, I might have mentioned this before, but I mean it's still relevant. Uh, in that the New Zealand Reserve Bank actually signalled in August 2020 that interest rates were going to go negative, and uh, banks were telling clients, that, you know, not to do any fixed rate hedging um, because of that. And then in November, uh, the Reserve Bank turned around and said, well, actually the economy is growing stronger than we thought, and um, interest rates aren't going negative. In fact. We will be raising interest rates, and we're one of the first countries in the world. What? And then you can see the very sharp move up that we've had in interest rates since then. Now, um, I'll admit we didn't think that interest rates would go up this quickly in the, and uh, to this extent, but I don't think we're alone there. I was at a tie to our conference the other day in Queenstown, and it was a presenter from Burl, uh, and the, one of their chief economists, and she said, um, "Okay." We got it wrong, 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 and she put her hands up and wrong again. And that was her opening comment as far as uh, the rise in interest rates go. Uh, you had all the banks saying that they wouldn't go up. You had the US Federal Reserve with its 800 PhD trained economists saying that interest rates wouldn't go up. So this has been a bit of a surprise. And it's just the aftermath of COVID. Um, there was no playbook written for COVID. They didn't know that the extent of the quantitative easing, i.e., you know, the buying of the bonds, the pumping of money into the system, would actually lead to this much inflation and therefore would have to be met with the monetary policy response. Uh, the good news, I think, though, is that interest rates have peaked out. Um, I don't think they're going back to those two little, all those two peaks that you can see, which was back in October last year and earlier this year. Um, they have come down, although they have, what, what we've actually seen since October last year over the last, last six months, you can see rates going up and down quite significantly. That's been the We've had the most intra-week and intra-month volatility that we've had since uh, the late 1980s in the aftermath of the 1987 share market crash. The markets have been gyrating between focusing on inflation going up and the need for interest rates to go up to compensate for it, and then focusing on the downstream effects of that, which was a recession brought about by the high interest rates, and therefore they would push interest rates lower because they didn't think that in a recessionary environment you could have high interest rates. New Zealand Reserve Bank, though, I must admit, have been probably the outlier in that one. They have said quite categorically that our number one priority is to fight inflation. And if the unwanted, unintended, well, not unintended, but the unwanted consequence of it is a recession, then that's what we have to uh, that's what we have to bear because we see inflation as being a, a bigger evil and um, uh, inflation as being a bigger evil than a recession. And they haven't they haven't deviated from that view. I mean. He has deviated on quite a few other things, but not that one. Uh, the the last blip up at the very right hand side of the graph, the last blip up was was brought about by the US debt crisis and the um, you know the uncertainty. That, well, not, probably not the uncertainty. They wouldn't pass it because I've done it 27 times, I think, in the last I forget how many years it is. They they take they take it to the brink and then they they have an agreement. The latest one actually was slightly different in that they didn't actually. Put a new ceiling on. They actually suspended the debt ceiling until the new, uh, well, the next president, uh, when he would take office, or if Biden runs and then he's in office until January 2025. But they have made some budgetary uh, concessions on it. 
the Gita. Uh, let me just go to the next slide. Um, I won't go. Through, I mean, this is the bland economic data. I won't go through too much of it. Probably the most important one, second one down, um, GDP that decreased by 0.6% in the December quarter. Uh, and that's the technical definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. We don't get the March quarter GDP out till not next week, but the week after. New Zealand's one of the last countries in the world to get its GDP data out. I, I don't know why. But this won't be the GDP data till the uh, this will be the GDP data from the end of March, which is obviously historical now. But the Reserve Bank are actually projecting that we won't be negative for the March quarter, therefore we won't go into the technical definition of a recession, but most of the banks in the market, I think, are expecting that we will go into that, um, that, that it will be a negative and that indeed we will be in a recession. Uh, the other one is the CPI. Now, that was down 1.2% in the March quarter and down 6.7% for the year. That was a bit of an outlier. They thought that it would be uh, 22 and 7.2 and for the quarter and 7.2 or 7.3 for the year. Um, 7.3 was, I think, was unchanged. 7.2 or 7.3, um, 7.2, yeah. But it actually came in lower than expected. And so, you know, there is a, and interest rates have come down since then, um, the longer term interest rates, but the expectation is that we have seen the peak in inflation. Um, most of the indicators, apart from, you know, food is actually one of the bigger ones, but I mean, oil prices are down, although we supposedly are getting the um, part of the uh, subsidy coming off. So those are the two most important um, pieces of economic data that we've had. Uh, if you want to read the other ones, then if you suffer from insomnia, then maybe you can read it in the middle of the night. Uh, not that riveting, but um, I just thought I'd include it. Uh, the next slide. Jump in. You say interest rates have peaked and have come down. Oh, okay. So that's no. I'll, I'll show you a graph. Yeah. So we've had, it was on the previous graph, but I'll show you the other one. The medium and longer term rates have peaked and are actually off their highs. But we have had shorter term rates continuing to increase. But I'll show you, there is a graph which, which shows that later on. Because I just got an interest rate spread from my my bank, but maybe I peaked with the uncertainty of the American. <laughs> In fact, long term five year rates were still going up. From the highs that we had on, on that previous graph, they are lower than those two peaks, the recent peaks that we have. They have, I mean, there's all this intra, intra well, it's intra week volatility, but they are below those two peaks that we have. And there is another graph, I think, which shows that later on. Um, Actually, if you just go through, I won't, won't worry with this slide, I'll go through to the next one. Um, so this is migration, and the reason I put that one up is that the week before the monetary policy statement, which was, what, two weeks ago, uh, two of the banks actually put up their forecast for the official cash rate. The ANZ put their, increased their peak from 5.5 up to 5.75, and Westpac, their one up to 6%. Westpac is especially predicated on the fact that the and migration was expected to reach 100,000 net arrivals, and that would place pressure on the inflation rate, and it would necessitate the OCR going to the going above the previously forecast 5.5. 5.5 was the peak that the Reserve Bank had in November 2022, and they haven't changed it since. Sounds ominous. Mm. Just talking about net migration because it's an interesting number. Um, I heard Brad Olson talk at a Zone 5 and 6 conference in Queenstown. He was talking about a number of 120,000. Is that, is, is that a known? Because he said it could peak at that. Uh, I think that was the uh, 100. Yeah. 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 But, but that's, a, sorry, and your buttons. So that's a real number? That's a real number of people coming in? Yeah. Oh, 
that, that, yeah, that, that's the prediction for the year. So that's the net. Well, I mean, it's been, you know, it, it has been a problem, you know, and it, and it actually has exacerbated the, um, you know, the lack of um, uh, employer, employees in the hospitality, you know, the service sectors especially. But it does, that, that, that does seem to be easing. I was in Queenstown for work last week and they just they, they were saying a couple of the big tourist operators said it is getting easier. I was there at that conference I was at actually and we we're in a hotel for two nights and it was a uh, they offered a um a voucher if you didn't get your room made up on the first night. So just to save staff. Uh, if we go through to the next slide. Now you probably can't well, actually that is very small, but the one uh, the, the graph on the left shows the um, the reserve tax expected track for the official cash rate. The one in blue is where they projected it to be in uh, the February monetary policy statement, and the one in red was the uh, May monetary policy statement. So they did expect it to be coming down um, quite sharply. Coming into you know sort of 2024, 2025. There is another slide coming up which does show the um, the actual numbers behind that. But feeling is that you know we might stay where we are for a while, and then we expect it to come off. Now those numbers which you might not be able to read. Sorry, it's just so small. Uh, the important ones under the GDP ones they are projecting in 2023 the June and the September quarters to be negative, which will mean that we're actually going. To According to their expectations or projections, we'll actually be getting the two consecutive quarters will be June and September. That's when we'll have the official definition of a recession. And the uh, the ones on the the ones on the right, the, the highlighted ones on the right, are the um, projections for the official cash rate, showing it staying around about 5.5 percent. And only by um, what is it, March 2025, going down to 5.1 percent. So those are the highlighted ones on the right. So. There is, it, it's a little bit of a contradiction, I think, because they're expecting inflation to come down, but it seems the, the, the way that you rationalise it is that they do have to keep the cash rate reasonably high for a while anyway to actually enable that to happen. So while we've probably peaked in the OCR, which was the Reserve Bank's from the monetary policy statement, um, they they don't expect that it'll it'll come down too much in the next year or so. Maybe if I just spend a couple of minute, minutes on the um, on the monetary policy statement because it was quite important um, when they came out with it. When they came out in the April monetary policy review, that was just after the U.S. banking crisis. Well, I don't know if it was a crisis; it was a problem. I don't think you can sort of characterise it as a, as a crisis. It wasn't that bad, but. The markets thought that he'd only raised by 25 points in response to that, and that he would come out with what we call a dovish statement. Dovish is more pessimistic, and interest rates might not go up to the same extent. Well, he, he did 50 points. He went to 5.25, and he said we're going to keep going. I mean, there was nothing dovish about it at all. In fact, it was quite hawkish. Um, you know, or I mean, you will have heard it before, but you know, the play on his name is shock and awe. You know, he just likes to do what the markets don't expect. So that was April, and then in, in the monetary policy statement two weeks ago, they thought that he would actually continue on that sort of hawkish vein, and he came out and it was actually quite a dovish statement, and he only increased by 25 points. He did do what he said he would do back in November and take it to 5.5, and he sort of indicated, well, did say that the expectation was that it wouldn't go any higher than that. And uh, not he didn't rule it out definitively, but that was the expectation. But he was actually quite um, pessimistic, and, and with regard to inflation, his view, his view on it was, and the Reserve Bank's view on it is that it won't actually be that inflationary. So he did say that you know retail sales are slowing down, and you know the economy appears to be slowing, and the effect of the interest rate increases is biting. So it actually, again, he came out totally what the markets weren't expecting. Um, the next slide. That is, uh, I've sort of covered that. But that's ANZ's expectations. Uh, well, the reserve bank. Miles, I just a couple of questions on that from uh, John and Graham. It's unfortunate that you have the ANZ forecast up there because that's my bank, and I was hoping to look for some positive news, but I've seen that graph before when they presented it to me. 
Uh, we talk about sort of in the media more in, in terms of dropping off. But if I look at that, that scheduled one before, don't have to put it back up again, we've got an OCR at 5.3 or 5.5 today, and we're 24 months, we're two years out, and we're maybe seeing 50 basis points. So, so as a business owner or anyone out there in, in that market, 50 basis points um, is not very much of a drop in comparison to the probably 5 or 6% increase in interest rates we've had. So at times I get a little concerned again, yeah, it's tailing off, but two years out, can you survive? I'm being facetious. Can you survive two years before you see 50 basis points? Yeah, we can fix them. We can do stuff going forward. But it does seem to me an extended period of time at those high rates that will create challenges for all manner of business, including us. Most of the big banks do see it by 2026. That's three years away. <coughs> there are interest rates, uh, there are um, an awful lot of mortgages coming off which are in the threes. And they're going to be replaced with sixes and sevens. And um, I think you know, that will actually that will put a break on the economy. It should put a break on inflation. I'll show you a slide later on on what actually demonstrates that a little bit. Um, Graham McGlynn. You've actually just touched on the point I was going to raise about the number of fixed rate mortgages that are um, coming off in the next relatively short period and the pressure on household budgets. It's going to be there, and uh, I just can't can't really believe that we're not going to see a recession over the next probably four to five quarters um, because of that impact. Unless the migration is significant enough that it's going to offset that uh, coming in. But uh, my gut feeling, having seen a few of these over forty years, um, is is that uh, the insolvency teams ought to be gearing up. And uh, that there's going to be quite a few more mortgage sales about, and the pro property prices will get get hit. There's going to be uh, a lot more personal financial distress out there over the next 12 to 18 months. I don't know if you've got a different view on that. Uh, no, the graph actually, which does show it later on. Look, I don't mean to give, I don't mean to be too morbid here, but um, I heard a shocking. I've never heard anything like it. We were down in in Bicargill for three weeks ago, and I heard it. <laughs> but it was an anecdote from one of our clients who said he'd just been to see his insurance broker, and um, he said there was a significant increase in the number of males, especially who were inquiring about the suicide provisions of their life insurance contracts. Um, their life insurance, yeah, their life insurance contracts, and that was simply driven by cost of funds. Uh, you know, the, the increased um, cost of their mortgages and their seemingly, you know, inability to um, pay the mortgage and sort of provide for the family going forward. And if you've got a million dollar mortgage, I mean, it's a, I don't, sorry, I don't know if I should have said it, but I just thought it was pretty. It's a pretty chilling sort of statistic or anecdote, put it that way. But you know, it does show the extent of the, the, the hurt out there. I think that's about as pessimistic as I can get. Um, now, now, the next one, uh, the next slide. Uh, now, um, that, that probably an answer to that question earlier on. Um, you can see the red line is the OCR, the black line is the 90 day bank bill rate, and the blue line is the. Um, Five-year swap rate. So while the 90, while the OCR and the and the 90-day rate have continued to go up, you can see that the five-year swap rate is off those highs that we you know those two peaks that I mentioned earlier on. So what this is is that the OCR is totally driven by the Reserve Bank, very closely correlated to the 90-day rate. But further out, those longer-term rates actually uh, are driven more by longer-term inflation expectations and future monetary policy. So they can more or less do what they want. And what they're doing here is they're actually preempting the end of the tightening cycle. And that they're actually looking forward sort of half to a monetary policy cycle and saying, well, interest rates are actually going to come off the night. The OCR will have to be have to be reduced and therefore those 
those term rates are coming down. So we're doing it early because we can do that. It's it's not governed by the um, by where the OCR is. Uh, the next one. Now this is the. Yeah, it's a little bit hard to read, but this is what I was saying before about an answer to your question, Graham, about you know the um, the tougher times coming up. Um, do you uh, the top left graph? Do you feel confident about enough increase to increase your future spending over the next twelve months? Well, you can see since February twenty twenty two, nobody does. That's all. That's all negative. Then I think the interesting one, though, the, the one I find the most interesting is the one on the bottom left. The number of response, the, the percentage of respondents planning to spend more on, and then the various subcategories. The only one they're expecting to spend more on is groceries, which they have to. On, and obviously, that's a um, that's non discretion. Uh, that's uh, non discretionary, not discretionary spending. Obviously, and international travels down. Um, eating out is the biggest one. Furniture, clothing, technology. So all of them. Apart from groceries, people are expecting to spend less on, and that I think is directly the result of that uh, those cost increases that are coming through in the form of higher mortgages. So um, hopefully that sort of answers the question. Um, one of the interesting ones is um, the bottom right one: uh, wages. So in 2022, uh, you know. Most businesses, you know, we're looking at increased wages. A friend of mine, he's on quite a few boards. He said they were all talking in 2022 about increased the cost of um, cost of wages going up. He said, and he told me earlier on this year, he said that, that's gone off the table now. He said there is no discussion really about increasing wages. We've had that. Uh, the next slide. That's a little bit hard to see again, sorry, but um, well, you can probably see that you've got it in front of you, I presume. So what that uh, just shows where we expected the OCR and the Fed funds rate, the US Fed funds rate to be. And we compared them to the 7th of March to the 31st of May when this presentation was, um, was put together. So you can see that the, um, the peak that we were expecting back in March was around that 540, uh, 549, 548, 549. That's not too much different at the moment. But what is more interesting, and in, in an answer to the question about rates coming off uh, earlier on, is that if you look down to the July on the left hand box in New Zealand, the July 24, they ex still expected the OCR to be at 506. Now, if you go through down to July, which is now the third one from the bottom in May, that's 466. So that's come off um, 60 odd points. So the expectations regarding the future OCR have dropped. And I think that's that's uh, to do more with uh, the inflation rate. And they believe that inflation is more or less under control overseas. They don't seem to be raising rates so much so that they think we, we may follow suit. Uh, the next one is the OCR. Is, I just put this in. Look, I won't go through it in too much detail. It's just the LGFA borrowing rates. And uh, just in the interest of time, um, the, the blue, the, the reason why the blue is highlighted is that those are the ones that Environment Canterbury can borrow at because there are different borrowing rates associated with different credit margins, and you're rated at AA plus. So um, now the next one. So this is Environment Canterbury's fixed rate hedging profile. The one in the green is. Is your interest rate swaps the one in the blue of the fixed rate bonds, and the grey, the grey shaded areas of debt. I think it was 76, 77 million. Then the I, I've, I've explained the bands before, haven't I? The um, the red bands, uh, the red lines. Let's do it again, Miles, just quickly. So we have said um, where we have minimum and maximum levels of fixed rate cover. And uh, the first one is not to two years, the second one is two to four years, and the next, and the one after that is four to eight years. So the minimum, let's make sure if I can the right figure. In not to two years, you have a minimum of 40% of cover, which is the bottom red line, and a maximum of 100. And the two to fours, there's a minimum of 20, which is the bottom red line in that middle 
band at a maximum of 80%, and then in the four to eight, it's uh, 0% up to 60%. So your policy compliance, well, at the moment you're, you're above the minimums, but um, where, where it's circled is you, you've, you've just, and it's just in the last month, you were compliant at March, there's a very minor policy breach there. We're below the level of fixed rate cover. Now the reason it's done that is because of time erosion, is that every month the hedging profile comes back and in the last month it's come back into a new bucket. You had a minimum of zero, but now you have to have a minimum of 20 because it's moved back in because of that process of time erosion. So we are looking to fix it. Um, and we are looking to do an interest rate swap if you just flick forward two graphs. Uh, the next one. But that shows that if we did a swap for $5 million, starting in 15 September 26, going to 15 September 29, the rate's 3.98. I checked that this morning and it's about 3.99, so it actually hasn't moved much. And that produces that dotted blue line, which will actually make your policy compliant at the, at the end of uh, June. Now that rate's 3.98. The interesting thing on that is that with the inverted yield curve we've got at the moment, it produces lower forward start rates. So this is a forward start swap. Because the rate going out to if we took a swap out now going out to September 29, that rate is about 450. But this rate's 398 because what we have is this inverted yield curve. I won't, it's a, it comes down to mathematics, I won't go into the, the details of it, but it does produce lower forward start rates. An inverted yield curve where short term rates are higher and longer term rates are lower is, is very unusual. The last time we had it was in 2008, just before the GFC. Normally it's a precursor to a recession. And you know it's an indicator, it's a fairly strong indication that we're going into recession. We obviously did go into recession in the GFC, and the expectation is we'll go into recession this year as well. So that's the bad news, but the good news is it does enable you to get lower rates than those that are currently available if you started the swap now, because if you start it later on, then you become policy compliant. Uh, and that's the one that we have been discussing with Brian. I mean, there is another option of doing a fixed rate bond. Um, if we could, so if, if, if there was the requirement for the debt, that's the next slide. Um, that rate is at uh, 5.12. Uh, it's 3.98, but you have to add the margin onto that. But you would be locked in at 5.12 at the moment. I think that's just slightly too high a rate starting right from now. And the other one, the other point I was going to mention was that um, we have been in discussions with, oh, that was on the, a couple of previous slides, uh, and you are going to be looking at establishing a bank facility with ANZ. The reason for that is for liquidity purposes. We've done the numbers, and it will it will mean that you've got more efficient um, cash flow. You can, you can introduce more cash flow management more sophisticated cash flow management um, practices. And it does give you that buffer because with because you know your debt does fluctuate quite a bit while your cash reserves do fluctuate quite a bit. And uh, with the um, requirement from the LGFA to maintain 110% liquidity, it just does provide you with a bit more certainty. And yeah, that, that was the latest decision, wasn't it, was to go ahead with that. So, um, Just explore that. So, we, we're you're proposing a an overdraft facility to give it, and you're suggesting that would give us greater flexibility of our cash management, but, and also benefit us financially. Yeah. While interest rates are at record highs, I don't, I don't understand how an overdraft facility, when you pay for the facility and then those super interest rates on top of a, taking out fixed rate loans. It's going, to be it's going to be a committed facility, so not an overdraft facility, which is quite lower, quite a bit lower. Uh, the pricing was what, around about 130, I think it was 1.3% 1, 1 with the line fee in the margin. So it's not going to be at overdraft rates. And um, yeah, as I say, we have done the numbers and just looking at it, it does make sense from an economic perspective. Just wasn't sure how you know, paying 10 or 11% oh, um, 
line, oh, I've got the exact number here, the line fee I think was 30 ish, yeah. and the margin was about 1.2. So the margin's 1.2 over the backfill rate, which is what, 5.6, so 6.8. But it's not intended to be used for a long time. There is one more slide on the maturity profile. Uh, that's when your actual debt facilities mature. So it does show a good spread of maturities. It's quite normal to have um, more in the shorter term. But when the FRN expire, when the FRNs expire this year, we will look to term it out more. So that's the end of the presentation. Thanks, Miles. Um, are there any further questions? Just one, one from me, and in terms of where, where things are sitting, inflationary, and and I, you know, coming up is we've got a general election, and um, the government's GPS spending um, to deal with uh, cyclone uh, in the North Island. How how is that impacted on on uh, that as, that assessment of uh, continuing five point five percent? Uh, is is that a, is that related to that that this the Reserve Bank have come out since the um, since the cyclone and the floods in Auckland and said there will be some impact on inflation as a result of that but they haven't actually quantified it at the moment and I haven't seen the Reserve Bank put a put an actual number or a definitive number on it they said it will lead to an increase but uh, they don't think it'll be that significant and it will be spread over a long time. And probably over a time when you know the inflation rate's coming down, so that will mitigate it to some extent. Well, thanks very much, Miles. Um, uh, that's that's pretty good, and, and it gives us a bit of an indication that um, you know we're we're in, we're in the hands of uh, a global a global situation, and um, we're doing our best to, to work our way out of it. Just do. One minute, uh, just on the quarterly report. What we do produce is a, a projected cost of funds, and I, I can tell you that your cost of funds at the moment is in the bottom quartile of, of local government. Three, uh, as at 31 March, it was 3.91 million. We actually just took over a new local authority as a client, and they were 5.9. Um, but it does show that your cost of funds won't rise significantly. It's in the graph. On do you have that copy in front of you? The interest rate risk management slide, which is what on our slide number is five, and it's interest rate projection. It's the, the solid blue line, and it does show that you've actually got a very stable interest rate of around about four uh, percent out to twenty seven, and then it does rise up. And the reason for that is that you actually have some very low fixed rate debt, which is rolling off then. So, compared to quite a number of councils, you're in a very good position from your future cost of funds. That's good to know as we go into an LTP. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Graham McGlynn. You should also be noting on page 41 and 59 of the pack um, the noting under policy of the compliance into our minute. No further questions? We'll note that, Graham. Thank you very much. Well, you may leave the table. Thank you. Um, let's just start in the minutes. Thank you. Um, no further questions, and I'll, I'll put the motion that the Audit Risk, uh, Audit Finance and Risk Committee receives the report from Bangkok Treasury Services to the 31st of March. We have a mover. Graham Naylor, Graham McGlynn. Any further discussion? No further discussion. All those in favour, please say aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. So we'll now just move to item 8.5, multi-year asset plan, and invite Brian to the table. Um, fundamentally, we'll take the, the report as read, but it's really to... Uh, underline that this is a, an initial attempt at a multi-year asset plan, um, something that we haven't had prior to this. Um, it gives us some 
visibility of the expectations in terms of capital spend coming up and the, some of the OPEX spend required to support those capital items along the way. Um, and of course, the reality of all these things is as we tick up the CapEx spend and supporting OPEX, that it starts to claim more and more um, of our income streams in terms of committed expenditure um, for future years. So um, really, it's a, a living document that will be updated with the LTP, future annual plans, the outcome of the property strategy, the outcome of the 30-year infrastructure um, plan, et cetera. Um, so this is essentially a baseline for us to start from. Any questions? Any questions? I've I've just got a, a, a couple, Brian. Um, on page forty-five, item eight, um, you know, program of 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 borrowing to cover capital expenditure um, covered by rates revenue for up to a ten-year period. Is that are we committed to a ten-year period in terms of borrowing, or is is there a possibility that we could extend the borrowing period to um, spread the load, if you like. Um, that is just historically what we have stuck to, the 10 year as a maximum. Um, obviously, depending upon the assets concerned, that was the discussion we had earlier this morning, really about the flexibility in that area. Um, and just in terms of uh, next steps, item 12, um, we have our infra infrastructure strategy, which is sort of developed with some 30 year projections, but, but given climate change and um, perhaps changes to river management, is that a, a time frame that, that we could potentially look at uh, reviewing the time frame and under which that infrastructure strategy is developed? I understand that that's a minimum requirement, but even within the uh, infrastructure strategy in the last LTP, there was already items being built in for ramping up that climate response. So you're even seeing it in the shorter term anyway at this point. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor McKenzie? So if this actually fits into here, but I, I was just, we, we've had um, in the last, well, much quite a lot of land purchases come up in front of us where we sort of uh, um, sort of what my position seems to have been an ad hoc approach to whether or not we're interested in buying and how we set values and things like that. Do we have a in, in our asset plan, do we have a view as to what land we should be buying and what land we shouldn't be buying or a priority? Or a, or a strategic view as to what is something we should be interested in and what is something we shouldn't be interested in. Uh, so that's that's related to the ongoing development of the land strategy, which uh, we've been working on for the last uh, kind of nine, 12 months that we're formulating what that might look like and therefore what are the resources that might be required and how what are the principles we might apply to allow those decisions to be made going forward so that's still work in progress but ultimately yes we want a longer term strategic view about what is the land we need to either have access to or to buy or to dispose of or to utilize in different ways to support the functions of the council thanks giles any further questions no further questions. Brian, you may leave the table. Thanks very much. And I'll put the motion. It's on page 44 that the Audit Finance and Risk Committee notes the development of a base three year asset plan that will be further updated as the annual plan, LTP, and other planning processes progress. Notes the changes in funding approaches occurring, including leased to capital purchase and capital purchase to cloud based as a service. Solutions. Do I have a mover for that? Councillor Scott, Graham McNaylor. Any further discussion? No further discussion. All those in favour, please say aye. Against? 
uh, carried. Thank you. Now I'll move to uh, item 8.6 or New Zealand audit report and invite um, Yvonne Young to um, uh, just uh, talk to us about that. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you, Chair. Kilo Kato. Um, I take this report as read, um, but just highlight a few things um, that um, are different to prior year or the plan. Um, so on page two, we have all the all the focus areas for the annual report financial information part. Um, the second one is fair value assessment of property, plant, and the equip equipment. Please note that this is a non revaluation year because last year um, the council has already done a full valuation for all the um, PPE and the infrastructure asset classes that require for fair value. This year it is only required for the management to perform a fair value movement, movement assessment to determine whether there is a significant difference between the fair value and the carry amount. If any, Yvonne, the um, government councillors don't seem to have. You're reading off that one? Is that what you're reading from? Um, some, mem some members haven't got that. Also, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, okay. We'll just see if we can find it. And um, yeah, just email it. Well, we're just, oh, we're just finding it first. Yeah, we just. Uh, yeah. email it. There was an email sent Deborah Breeding on Friday, the second of June. Which has got it on. Just carry on, Yvonne. Um, so on this page, we have got a few audit focus areas that in relation to the FY 2023 June annual report financial information part. Um, there are a couple of differences. Um, if you can scroll down the page to the lower part of the page, please. Uh, the lower part of the, yeah, um, thanks. Um, so please note that this is a non revaluation year. Last year, the council has done a full valuation for all the classes of the property, plant and equipment and infrastructure assets. This year, as a starting point, it is only required for the management to perform a fair value assessment to determine whether there is a significant difference between the fair value and the carrying amount. A revaluation is only required when that assessment determined that there is a significant difference. Um, can you please move to the next page? And there's no difference on this page, this similar audit focus area as last year. Um, if we go to the next play, page, which is page four, there's a new um, audit focus area coming from a new accounting standard, which is the PBEFIS 48, Service Performance Reporting. It is a standard that requires a appropriate and meaningful mix of performance measure. There's a, um, a quite a bit of a, a additional disclosure obligations on the council for the 2023 um, annual report. Um, it is required to disclose um, certain judgments that have the most significant effect on the selection, measurements, aggregation, and presentation of service performance information. Um, we will be providing a checklist to the management to perform a to perform a self review, um, so to ensure that the council will be compliant with the new accounting standard. Um, if we can just move to page eight. That's the one to go up a little bit. Thank you. Um, 
it is a um I guess it's quite a big change for us in terms of the our audit approach. Um, there's a new auditing standard called RSNZ 315 um, that come effective for the um, 2023 June financial year. Um, it has um, placed a greater emphasis on identifying and understanding the IT applications and the um, related in, internal control arising from the use of IT. So our um, IT team will place more um, emphasis on these areas for um, the upcoming audit. If we move the next um, two page, the page 10, that's here. Um, yeah, that's the materiality. Um, this is based on the budget um, numbers, which is the annual plan. It only slightly up from last year, so there's no significant changes in terms of the um, the maturity that we're working on. If we move on to the next page, please. These are the um, performance measure in your service um, performance information that we select for um, testing purpose. Um, so the first three are the same as last year if we can move the lower part of the to lower part of page yeah. so the the last two are the new um, performance measure that we select for this year or the purpose um one is in relation to the um water quality and the other is the um relation to the um resource management the um timeliness of the resource consent application. Um, I think that's all I want to um, highlight in, in terms of the audit focus area. The only thing left is on page 15 in terms of the audit timeline. Um, we we have done a lot of work to get um, our audit timeline back on tra track. So. Um, at this stage, we can actually commit it to um, um, to get um, the timeline back on track and to meet the statute deadline, which is the end of October, um, for the council to adopt its annual report. So on the page 15 is this our timetable um, um, in in relation to the planning and the interim and the final audit um, timing here, um, but. When it's close to um, the final visit, we can decide on um, the final adoption date with management in August and um, September time. Um, that's all I want to highlight here from my order plan, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Graham Naylor. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Yvonne. For the uh, service performance information, so are you assessing this at an individual component level rather than at an overall view we need to do that with the financial statements? So if there's one element which is um, non-compliant, would that get a modification on the opinion? Um, for the service performance information we select one two three four five as material performance information if one of them um that as you say not compliant or we say it's not appropriately disclosed then yeah we 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 will be assessing the result of the or the report because they are individually material to the statement of service information. Thank you. Any other questions? Genevieve. Thank you. Um, just with regards to the levels of service, um, or I'm just sort of quite new at this, but I'm just wondering, does it randomly, um, do you randomly pick out different areas to audit? 
or are there ones that sort of are highlighted through a different process or uh, no it's 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 not a random selection for our audit purpose um usually for regional council the flooding protection is a mandatory um for once measure for us to assist because it's the key um sort of operating or area for a regional council and then we will be looking at transportation and um, water quality, air quality, and um, the um, resource consent application timeliness. So we do have a guideline from OAG that um, certain parameters that for us to assess whether this level of service is mature or not. Thanks, thanks, Yvonne. Um, any further questions? I, I think given um, that some of you haven't read that report, that maybe if if you do read it and you've got other questions, just um, just let me know or let staff know, and um, and we can forward them to Yvonne. That's okay. Otherwise, Yvonne, you may leave the table. Thank you very much. I'll put the motion. John, are you wanting, have you got a question? Motion uh, that the Audit Finance and Risk Committee receives the Audit 22-23 update provided by Yvonne Young, Audit Director, Audit New Zealand, um, moved by Councillor Sunkel, seconded by Councillor Scott. Any further discussion? No further discussion. All those in favour, please say aye. Against, Harry, thank you very much. Now, a, a recommendation to uh, go into public excluded. And I'll move that, um, I move that the Brian Elliott, Chief Financial Officer, uh, Stefan Theron, I don't think he's in the room, and Senior Advisor, Audit Assurance, Tanya Smeets, uh, Manager of Risk Assurance and Committee remain after the public have been excluded for the public excluded agenda as they have the knowledge that is relevant and will assist the council. And that at uh, 2.31, 2.31, resolution to exclude the public set out on page 57 of the agenda be adopted. I have a mover, Councillor Suncall, Councillor Robinson, all those in favour, please say aye. Okay. We'll now move into public excluded. So, so we're now uh, back into the public meeting and um, just reporting our next uh, item 10. Our next meeting is proposed to be on Wednesday, the 23rd of August at one o'clock. And I'm wondering, uh, item 11, I'm wondering if Councillor Caraco, if you could finish with a karakia.